Hey everybody, and welcome back to the Tel Aviv MSP podcast. Very, very excited to introduce our guest here today. Ken, would you like to introduce yourself? Oh, sure. Um, Ken Patterson. I am VP of Communities and Ecosystems at Taylor Business Group. Um, and yeah, happy to be on the show. Awesome. And uh, hey, everybody, um, welcome back. I'm Jeremy. I have partnerships at Tel Aviv, and we help over 100 MSPs capture new prospects with the risk assessment widget on their homepage. Uh, run automated risk assessments. Um, MSPs like Halt Data Solutions, Try to Network, Solify Management, use Telby to run risk assessments to win new clients, uh, convert website traffic to sales calls uh, with the homepage widget, help clients be compliant. Um, and they also love Telby because they reduce risk assessments that take seven, eight days manually to under five hours, fully automated with Telby. All right, so let's dive right into it. Um, could you tell our community, anybody who might not be aware already, uh, about uh, Taylor Business Group? Absolutely. So Taylor Business Group is, uh, well, it's a coaching education and for, for so everybody understands it, what we call business improvement groups, the rest of the world calls peer groups. Um, mm. and the reason why we call them business improvement groups is they're, they're exactly that. I think all peer groups are great. I think that every MSP should be looking to get into some kind of peer group. So there's no, <clears throat> there's no slight there. But what Taylor does with this business improvement group is you know, we have facilitators in the groups that help coach and help rise up. We also have our own uh, SaaS benchmarking tool. So we're able to benchmark where they're at, you know, where they start and how to help them get them to where they're going with a benchmarking tool that benchmarks, benchmarks their financial metrics and all of that stuff. Um, and it's a unique situation where recently I was reminded about experience. You know, we all talk about the experience. CX has become a thing where people are talking about customer experience more, which is great because in the end of the day, it's all about the customers, right? It's all about the end, the people that you're serving. <clears throat> and for us, we're helping MSPs in the industry get to the next level, not just by the financial side. That's where people get a little confused. It's every level of your business. We help with finance. We help with we have a COO group, we have a CFO group, we have a service manager group, a project manager group, we have a CAM group, and we even have marketing. So we've taken that whole sphere of things that can weigh a business down, especially MSP businesses, where if anybody was like me as an MSP back in the day, I was a guy who fixed crap. I was an engineer. I had no clue about this business stuff when I started my business thinking I wanted to help everybody out. So getting hmm. that help is critical to getting out of the weeds and getting to the next level. So that's really what Taylor Business Group does. It's that experience. We help with that experience. It's different than just a regimen coach. It's different than a, a regimen peer group. It's more about the experience. What we deliver to these MSPs is the whole experience. And it really does have a cool feel to it where our members are like family. And we coined the phrase for our members by our members over 20 years ago. Uh, that's incredible. And sorry about that delay. I was just uh, realizing my mic was not on. Can you all hear me now? Oh, yeah. Oh, no, I can hear awesome. you. Hear you. <laughs> so uh, thank you for that rundown. And I want to dive into each aspect of that from the tool to the peer group, mentoring, coaching, and service that you all provide uh, holistically and uh, your, your experience, your past experience as well, coming from an engineering background. So perhaps we could start with the tool. The tool really intrigued me. Um, you mentioned it does benchmarking. How does that work? What's the logic behind it, uh, how it works? So basically what the tool does is it takes, <clears throat> basically what we do is we get, we bring people into Taylor Business Group. We have what we call TAP compliant, which is Taylor's compliant level to get, we wanna make sure we're, we're getting them to an actual baseline, right? Here's where you have to be to get started with Taylor and move forward from there. So they have their baseline. The tool itself, takes their, we take their chart of accounts and we pull it into the tool. And then by monitoring all the key metrics, you know, we have net operating margin, net operating income. There's a bunch of metrics that go along with this benchmarking. And we month to month in every meeting discuss why things are going up, why things are going down, what's working, what's not working. And the tool allows us to have visualization into the numbers, right? Because numbers don't lie. You know, you, mm -hmm. you know, owners all the time are going to say, sure, we're really profitable. Then you dig into their books and you realize 
holy crap, you know, yeah, you may have went from 1 million to 3 million, but your profitability went through the floor as you did that. Um, <laughs> I say that because I did that. Um, so <laughs> it took me forever to get a million dollars as an MSP. And when I went from one to three, I thought, Woo, I'm killing it. And then I didn't realize I wasn't paying attention to the bottom line and I didn't have metrics in place to do that at the time. And so, yeah, I could see that happening because I actually witnessed it myself back when I was running my MSP years ago. So <clears throat> good. About that story specifically, you, you were raising in revenue, but perhaps the expenses were going up as well. And exactly and overcome the profitability problem. Could you share the story there? It might be a story that a lot of MSPs share. Oh, sure. I mean, you know, look, you, you, you claw and scrape and, and fight for that first million, right? I mean, uh, I have a story when I was getting to that first million, I was, we were roughly about 20, 30 grand away. And I wanted to buy something myself just to put us over the million dollar. <laughs> Cause I was so like, I heard about, you know, you get to that million dollars and you know, you can get to the next level and, and that first million's rough. And, you know, it was really tough getting there. So everything was scratching and clawing. When we hit that million and we started to turn the corner, we were getting new clients. We were doing good things, but we were spending at such a high rate to do it. There was no measurable. There was no, uh, you know, I had no system and processes in place to really watch that. I wasn't an accounting person. I was an engineer. I didn't really bring on any accounting people until I smartened up and learned about processes. And it wasn't until I got uh, traction to be honest, um, in place, which is, you know, an, an entrepreneurial operating system, which by the way, you can use traction Patterson. There's a whole bunch of no relation to me, by the way, Patterson, wish it was, um, those are tools. Those are entrepreneurial operating systems that can get your business and everybody in your business rowing in the same direction. So it wasn't until I did that, that really changed all those mistakes that I was making. Cause I wasn't watching it. I was just spending thinking that the making, you know, the making it would fix the spending it. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm sure there's a, there was a very logical sort of reasoning to get there, right? There, there's a reason why, you know, it was a very tempting to spend. What were you spending on and what was the results you were getting back from it that made it so, you know? Yeah, I mean, look, <clears throat> first of all, we all fall uh, in the MSP industry. We all fall victim to shiny toys. Um, you know, as an owner, I was going out to events and seeing lots of shiny toys and bringing them back to my team and just basically going here, check all these out. And then, you know, as a result, no one thing was getting done. Mm -hmm. They were looking at all these tools and we were spending time and losing lots of money on spending time on tools that we just didn't use because I didn't put any focus behind it. I didn't actually have a plan, a process. Even when I was evaluating the, vend the, the vendors that were providing these tools, <clears throat> I never really thought about it enough because I thought, well, these are pretty cool stuff. My engineers will figure it out and we'll go from there. And that's not how you do it, right? Um, and it wasn't until learning from my peers and, and growing with other MSPs that were doing it right and getting things in place and learning about processes and also from learning from my old mis own mistakes that I started to refocus and take myself out of the weeds and see what was actually going on. And obviously getting something like traction where we got processes in place and we had meetings wrapped around everything that we were doing. Um, mm. and we all started rowing in the right direction. So, um, so that's one part of it. And the other part is because we don't know a lot about sales and marketing, we fall victim to really bad sales and marketing companies who tell us, oh, I can 5X your business in, in three months and I can do this and I can do that. And it was so prevalent back then that it almost all seemed like, well, it must be working. There's so many of them. So, you know, I I definitely can say I spent, you know, tens of thousands of dollars on marketing plans that went nowhere. Yep. And I also <laughs> learned, you know, yeah. And then I learned the true path of marketing does take time and you have to be patient. And you can't give up on it too early. Um, but I learned these lessons all the hard way back in the day. I was just you know, putting my head down, getting stuck in the weeds and doing these things. And it wasn't until I started to learn from my peers and start to pick up on what was working and what wasn't working, get involved with traction, all those things kind of coming together, turned the business around to where we went, you know, from three to five, five to seven, seven to nine, and then eventually sold. And, nice. and so, you know, and everybody says, oh yeah, that it's like, yeah, but you know, I don't ever claim to be an expert because I've done the MSP thing a bunch of times. What I say is just learn from my mistakes because I made a lot. 
right? And, you know, that's all you can do. You can't claim to, I don't think there's really many experts in our field per se. I just think, you know, you make mistakes, you learn from them. And the best part, the best thing you can do is share with others and, and help them not make those mistakes. Um, so yeah, I did that. I went from owning the MSP, selling the MSP, helping other MSPs, um, and then to Pax8 and, you know, and, and now to Taylor Business Group. Yeah. And Taylor Business Group gave us the best, uh, me, the best ability to help MSPs in such a way for me that made me feel good about it because I really am an MSP at heart and that's what I care about. Yeah. Ken, let's dive into that. So um, for any MSPs who are relating to your experiences, the mistakes that you make, they're in it right now, right? I know like off the top of my head, I know MSPs were facing this challenge right now. Um, you mentioned processes. How, tying it back to Taylor Business Group, how does Taylor Business Group, you know, your, your coaching and the, the peer groups and the tool, how, what do you mean by process? What, what actually happens? Yeah, well, so, I mean, one, like I said, having EOS in place builds your, you know, helps you build that structure. You're actually having structured meetings. You're building around what the company needs, driving in the same direction. From a process perspective, it's about understanding something that gets lost, Jeremy, quite a bit when you're doing, especially for us as MSPs, is we want to fix stuff. We're yeah. IT people and we want to fix stuff. We're like a puppy. We're going to run to every problem and we're going to, you know, that's how we act. But remember, we're still in business and we have to pay bills and we have to pay our techs and we have to, you know, all these things require structure and a process. If you go to a payroll company, they have a process. They don't just throw money at everybody in the company, right? And that's what I feel like we are doing when we jump into business without knowing who we are, what we do, and who we serve. And that's at the very core of, I, I say this outside of Taylor, outside, just in general, if you're an MSP right now and you don't know those three things, get back to basics and figure it out. Because if you're just saying I'm fixing everything and doing everything because I know IT, you'll never have any direction. You'll never be, there's no focus. And that's a big thing, problem that we have as, that I have as an engineer, as a person who started out technical, I was, I was focused on my work, but it was also, I just wanted to fix everything. So a process is putting things in writing and understanding you have to get, if you have to get to A to Z, what does B look like? What does C look like? Right. And if, as, and by the way, no process is perfect. I'm sure you know this, Jeremy, you've done this a thousand <laughs> times, right? You put a process in place, but if you don't start building the process and understanding where it breaks so you can fix those little pieces along the way, yeah, right. yep. yeah you'll never get to Z. It'll yeah. always be, well, we we thought we had a process, but it broke, or we're just trying to do different things. You have to stick to those processes and you have to build metrics to measure those processes. You have to have everything that you do should be measurable. Uh, Ken, I want to ask you about the concept you just raised about focus and, yeah. oh, falling into the trap of, oh, we just do everything, right? There's nothing we can't do. Therefore, we do everything. I talked to a lot of MSPs. There, I, there's kind of two groups. I, like, for example, I went to IT Nation, talked to a bunch of MSPs, and I sort of noticed there was the, 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 the group of MSPs who would say, oh, yeah, you know, we, we, we're industry agnostic. We, we, we work with all sorts of clients. We do all sorts of work, cybersecurity, IT, everything you, you need us to do. And then there's some who say, oh, we only focus on legal firms or we do manufacturing or we focus on healthcare and finance and that's it or, or compliance and that's it. And, and I'm curious to ask you, because you say, you know, it might not be a great thing just to say we do everything and to focus, what, uh, is, it, is it necessarily bad to, uh, as an MSP to, to, to serve every industry or, you know, <laughs> Yeah, it's a good question. And Jeremy, I'm one of those people that I don't think any, if your business is running and you think that's the way it should be and it works for sure. you, nothing's bad. Like, I don't, I'm not a very, I'm not very uh, excited about people who call break fix a joke and make comments about, listen, break right. fix, break fix is always going to be here. All, someone's going to need something mechanical or electronic fixed. And you're always going to have break fix. So if that's your business model, cool. Don't let people tell you it's it's wrong. It's not wrong. It's what you want to do and you're focused on it. Cool. Same with doing something like, hey, uh, I want to I want to take care of everybody. The reason why I say focus is I think uh, for me personally, I believe it should be somewhere in the middle of we mm. only have one vertical or we do it all. I think that you should be 
focused on one, two, maybe three verticals that you can understand and learn very well. So you could be the expert in that and that in those fields to help those people. And the reason why I say one, two, or three, COVID made it very clear that if your if your vertical was, oh, I don't know, hospitality, you were done because hospitality shut down during COVID, right? So, Mm -hmm. you know, one of the one of the great one of the great examples of this was a friend of mine who has an MSP in Vegas. Obviously, hospitality is big in Vegas. Hospitality hospitality was one of his biggest verticals. And when that got shut down, he could have went under. I mean, he was in bad shape because most of these places now he had deals with their back offices while their back offices were still running. He still helped them stay alive during COVID. So he had some work, but the bulk of his work was being shut down. What helped him was a shift to cannabis. And as people want to say what they want to say, cannabis is actually more highly regulated than HIPAA because of, because it's new. (laughs) The government's all yeah. over. Right? There's all these. There's all these rules and regulations. Yeah. They yeah. need IT. They yeah. need security. They need yeah. all those things fall into line with cannabis. I, and then, by the way, it's cannabis since COVID to now is, if not the highest, one of the highest micro verticals to come out. Period. And you know, a lot of people say, well, I'm not being involved with that because it's, you know, cannabis. Like, listen, it's becoming legal. It's a thing. It's not my jam, but it's it's out there, right? So it's not like it used to be where you're getting involved with a bad company or bad bad dealings. Right, right. Um, so, it, but his shift literally saved his business because the business on that end, it was like a hockey stick. It was, inc- it was crazy. And not many people were doing it. So I always say to people, look for verticals that you can get really good at. And focus on, you know, back in the day, um, uh, you know, I would, I, I honestly would never recommend getting into uh, chiropractors. They're not very, it's not very good business, but um, dentists even sometimes a little bit off. But the yeah. cool thing about dentists is if you learn Dentrix, Patterson Dental, another Patterson, which I'm not related to, I got to figure this stuff out. All these Pattersons are rich. Um, <laughs> Patterson Dental, Dentrix, all these companies that just work for the dentist. If you get to know them, work with them. You may not even deal just with dentists. You can work with the actual companies that to supply them their their um, equipment. Those companies need regulations and need to be secure and need IT. So, really getting highly specialized in a couple of verticals, you know, for backup and just for for um, to you know expand your portfolio is good. I just don't think saying I do it all because you there's going to be times where someone comes to you and says, "Hey, Jeremy, um." You know, I've got this law firm over here and we got, you know, 60 members, but we need to know if you know Westlaw. Mm. How well you know Westlaw. And yeah, you might be able to fudge your way through saying that you know it, but it'll get that'll get hashed out. You won't know as much about Westlaw that you as you need to know. So um for me, it's it's finding those verticals that work for you for what you want to do again, knowing what you want to do and who you want to serve. And then um and then going hard at it, go to their, go to their conferences, go to, you know, go to the actual, the companies that support them, their conferences, and just be a part of those communities. And you could do very well. You don't have to do everything and you don't have to serve everyone. You just find those niches and then stay with them and stay on top of how they work and what their needs are and what their regulations are. You can do very well. I really appreciate you breaking it down like that because, because yeah, and it's starting to make sense to me now too. Uh, number one, expertise. Oh, I, I understand this industry niche uh, need and problem you have. I've already solved it before for like, you right. know, 10 other uh, peers. And uh, also with sales, like in terms of building trust, right? Uh, when somebody goes to you and they go, hey, I, I you know, there's this really big problem. I care a lot about it. Can I trust you to do it, you know, having having that expertise in that vertical absolutely helps, but also referrals, right? Because it's it's a small community. It, right. And so so word of mouth, as you mentioned that you work with the dentist office and you work with the dentist vendors, um, and then the sales uh, strategy becomes a lot clearer too, going to uh, uh, conferences, um, industry specific, specific conferences, now that you mention it, but an MSP that I spoke to who, who focuses on legal firms, they just go to bar conferences, legal yes. conferences, yes. and it's a lot, clearer right that your sales strategy too where the where you're pointing your business um and, and so yeah thank you so much for that i'd love to hear if you have one more story around 
um, you working with uh, MSPs as part of uh, Taylor Business Group. I'm curious, what problem do MSPs come to you with? You know, how do you help them solve it end to end? And what's the end result and impact? Um, you know, uh, yeah, just like a full end to end experience of being a part of Taylor Business Group. You mentioned peer groups. I'd love to understand what that experience is like, too. Yeah. So, I mean, the peer groups are part of it, right? It's the coaching is part of it. Coaching and peer groups are one, which is why we call them business improvement groups. Um, I can give you a, just a story of uh, one MSP who um, was very apprehensive about joining Taylor, just as MSPs are, yeah, right? They're, they're nervous. They're not sure they want to make the investment, which by the way, we're probably one of the least expensive investments. Also, we get with the value, the return on investment is it's fantastic. And just knowing one thing to understand for me to leave what I was doing to come to Taylor to help Taylor do this meant that I understood that how many people they were helping and that the plan mm. works. And that's just me. I'm not a salesperson. I don't pitch. But when I believe in something, I kind of wear my heart on my sleeve and just so you'll hear it. Yeah. Um, so yeah. so um, this this person came to Taylor and was and basically I think it was it took three years for him to finally sign up. He had been working with folks at Taylor for three years. He had been talking to me about it as a, as a, as a peer and mentor. Cause I, you know, we, we had known each other for years and um, he finally bit the bullet. He got in on what we call the grant program, which we're offering right now. It's a special first year price to help MSPs smaller and, and, and trying to get grow MSPs to take a little bit of the uh, edge off their first year. Um, and so he came in on the grant program <clears throat> and when we, what we found was his net operating margin was at 7%, which is in the red. It's not great. And, you know, he had had some issues, you know, he was in that million, million and a half range, right? So 7% is not going to give you a whole lot of, uh, that margin isn't going to you know lump you a whole lot of money. It's probably about a hundred thousand dollars. Right. So he, came into the program, got his stuff in, started to buy into the systems. And basically what happens with the systems is you're, you're being held accountable every month. So if you went out and did some crazy spending, it's going to show. The numbers are going to show and you're going to be called out for it. Not in a bad way, but that accountability is what we all need, by the way. Yep. That's what yep. killed me in my first couple of years of that MSP. I didn't have really the full accountability. Me and my partners just had no clue and we were just doing it. Having the accountability and also the group kind of acts as your board of advisors. These are people that you'll come to love and trust over time like family. And but they also know the inner workings of your business. So as you're doing this, not just the coach, but the people in the group are going to go, whoa, whoa, Jeremy, man, I did that. Don't go down that road. Mm -hmm. Here's why. Right. So that those pieces started to come oh. together. Year two, he doubled his net operating margin just by getting his finances in order, learning about better operations and cleaner efficiencies, getting processes in place, and then learning from his peers. So year two, he was at 14%, which basically gave him now about $210,000 in net operating margin back on his business. Fantastic. And by the way, how's your ROI on maybe spending, you know, <clears throat> if it was full price, uh, 12 or $15,000 over those two years to make Two hundred and ten thousand dollars, right? That's what I love about this too. You can't say there's no ROI. You get to watch it yourself in your own numbers as it grows. Oh. And then year three was impressive. Year three he almost tripled it. Didn't quite get to the triple mark, but his net operating margin was three hundred and fifty thousand dollars. So that's pretty cool when you think about a three-year journey. Of and by the way, it's painful. It hurts a little bit, yeah. first, right? Because you're an owner. You're not used to other people telling you how to do things or push you in a direction, but you need it because we're not just your average owners. We're people who are technical, who became owners, right? And even though your entrepreneurial, you know, ego gets a little pushed around, you become more entrepreneurial through the process too, because you understand how it should work, what people should look like, how your employees should perform when they're not performing. What do you do? There's so much, it's so hard to explain all of it, Jeremy, all the pieces mm -hmm. out of it as you're doing it, right? Because, you know, during this process, he probably learned how to hire better, how to fire better, when to fire, when to fire customers and how to do it more efficiently. Like all wow. of these things come out of these conversations um, 
And then, you know, now in year three, and by the way, one, here's the most impressive thing about this whole entire journey. I'm trying not to give the whole thing away because some people who hear this will know who this is. During this three-year process, he had an engineer that he took care of through sickness and health, all that stuff, who left him and started stealing clients from him in a major way, yet still in year three, almost tripled the net operating mm. margin. Think about that. So- in that case of someone that I know very well, so I could easily dig in and, and talk to him about it and see it and feel it um, from that's your beginning to end, right? Beginning, not looking very good, bleak. You're a struggling owner. You could see it. You're not taking home a whole lot at the end of the day. And to the end where, hey, much more comfortable, can invest back in the company to keep growing and learning um, and still a member. He, I think he's in year four or five now. <clears throat> you know, oh. so- and again, it runs the gamut, right, Jeremy? Not everything's going to be, you know, from one to a hundred, but we do have one, um, one very special case where we have an MSP who started out around a million dollars, and I think he's approaching a hundred million right now. Um, so, and obviously that comes when you hit forty or fifty, you start acquiring, and then that's how that starts to go, or thirty, whatever. You can do it at any level, but it just shows you that <clears throat> it works. And, you know, I don't go around and I'm not talking about peer groups, other peer groups or anything. I think that every MSP should get into a peer group that feels comfortable mm -hmm. to them and how it works, but not mm -hmm. too comfortable. Because yeah, yeah. Yeah. if you get into a group full of people that say, Jeremy, that's all right. Try again. It's OK. It'll work. Instead of Jeremy, look, and I'm not not trying to tell you how to do things. But if you had done it this way, you might have had a better a better outcome. Right. Because it's all about outcomes. And at the end of the day, one of the things looking out for you. Do, yeah, right. And and you know that people care about you when they tell you, hey, Jeremy, you got some spinach in your teeth, right? Yeah. Like you know, <laughs> I'm gonna tell you the truth because we're friends, right? I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna sugarcoat it or hide it. I don't think that's being a good friend. And that's how you have to do that. And one thing to take away from this too is when you go into these groups, a lot of people are like, Well, I'm not trying to sell my business, so I don't need to do that. Wait, what? It's not about selling your business. Sure, this will give you your best chance to get a higher multiple. But aren't you, in the end of the day, trying to be the most efficient to make the most money? So yep. there are two options, Jeremy. It's either you want to build to be acquired or you build for generational wealth. They have both the same plan, though. It's mm -hmm. about making your books look appealing if someone wants to come in and buy it. But if they're appealing and efficient, you're going to make money. It's not that difficult of a thing to think about when you're doing it. So for me, it's like, look, get started. Get started somewhere. My whole goal is to help MSPs. And by the way, if an MSP reached out to me and said, look, I'm really not interested in Taylor Business Group right now, but I need a little help, I'll talk to them. I'm not, I'm not trying to sell anything here. I know it works. And I can tell you when it's a good time to, to do it and, and, run, and get involved. But my goal overall, Jeremy, which is why I come on to things like this, is to educate and spark thought conversation. And if someone reaches out to me and says, hey, I need a little help, I'll help them. I'll push them in the right direction. I'll give them good advice because at the end of the day, it's about our community and it's about what we're trying to build and how we're trying to build it. We want rising tides raise all ships. That's the that's the line. We had that at Pax A couple of other people have adopted, everybody's adopted it. It's a right, it's a right thought process because we do have a lot of dinghies that shouldn't rise <laughs> in this industry that are doing it wrong and making us all look bad from an MSP perspective. I um I I think everything that you said makes so much sense. And thank you for sharing that story. I learned a lot just from listening to that. A couple of things. I I love how you know when when you when you were first talking about the the, the financials and cleaning the numbers and and being efficient. I love how unsexy that is. It's right. about <laughs> doing the hard work, right? right? Doing the due diligence and and building a system and a process where you have accountability. I I, I face the same challenges as a business owner, as a CEO, as a founder. It's it gets lonely up there. And you might have a team, you might have even co-founders, but they might be technical co-founders. But, but, but it's very difficult to find peers who are in that same spot thinking about the business, the long-term strategy, growing, and, 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 and uh, also along with that, the accountability or someone who even knows to check. Hey, well, well, what did you do there? Does that make sense? Are you sure? Know what questions to ask? Hey, what if you did it this way? Or you know, uh, what are you actually trying to solve? And does that right. fit? 
And, and so having this system of peers and, and mentors and coaches regularly, right, with you, uh, reviewing, checking, challenging, debating, discussing, uh, I, I, it's so valuable. And, and I think, you know, entrepreneurs who are always seeking to learn, seeking to grow, uh, are seeking out these opportunities uh, to, yeah, to build. And, and, as they, and as they should be, right? And it's funny, you hit yeah. the nail on the head. CEOs are lonely, but you know who's the most lonely out of all this? Service managers. The service managers, think about it. That's why we have groups going all the way through the whole company. But service manager is the one that oh. I think is the, is the biggest key point to think about it. Service manager has everybody above them managing them and telling them what has to happen. And then they have the techs below them that make it really hard on them because we know techs can be difficult, right? I was a difficult tech. Everybody, you know, you just, I'll put my tickets in later, the, all of it. So the service managers don't have anybody to share their stories with. So that's why I feel like even with all the groups we have, the service manager group is so key because now a service manager can go into a group with a like-minded person who's dealing with the same crap that they are and actually talk about it. And even though we say all our groups, like what happens in the group stays in the group because it's their private world, service manager is the most important one because when they go talk, they're talking about their CEOs, they're talking about their bosses, they're talking about their techs, but they mm. want to do it in a safe place where... If they're wrong in what they're saying, another service manager could say, no, man, that's your your job. You should probably do X, Y, and Z, and that'll fix that. Or, oh, man, that sounds like an out-of-place employee. You should probably be chatting about this. Or your CEO, you should probably have a conversation with your CEO about this, this, and this. But it's because it'll be brought to you by people who are doing it already, right? You're not dealing with someone just giving you random advice saying, yeah, man, you should yeah. quit. Like that, that's tough. And service managers do that all the time, right? They just quit their job because they don't understand how much of it was them, how much of it was, you know, the people that work around them and what could have been fixed in between if they were just chatting with people who do it all the time like them. So as much as the owners need it, because I know I needed it, the service managers, I feel like are right there with the owners because they don't have any place to turn. They don't, they don't go home and say, hey man, I had this really bad day today and this is what I dealt with. No one at home knows. The CEO doesn't care. The techs don't care. And by the way, you can't go talking to the techs like that because you get too friendly with the techs. That becomes a whole separate problem. Um, so yeah, having these these this peer this group of peers separate from the coach who's going to direct you and you know put everybody in a better place. The peers it how, how, how it goes all the way down through the service managers. It really shows you all have thought through every nook and cranny of the <clears throat> MSP business. I want to switch gears a little bit because you have okay. a very, very fascinating experience uh, in your career that I want to get to. Um, could you tell us about the story of your MSP? And you know, congratulations on on, on the successful exit. I would love to hear what uh, that, that what that story was. Uh, well, I don't think we have enough time for that whole story. <laughs> it was a it was a long, long stretch. But I know you wanted to get to the story and then roll that into, you know, how I ended up going into the vendor side and all that, but. And also learnings, right? Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. I mean, look, like I said, I'm a mistake maker. So, you know, I, and I'm all about, I learned over time, I should make mistakes, but I should make them fast and move on. Right. It's so much better than thinking I'm, I'm going to think everything out and make the perfect move. And, right. um, and that's something, if MSPs are watching this and they want to take something away, that's something right there. To take away look make your mistakes but make them quick and move on the only way to find out what works and what doesn't work is to do it or talk to someone who's done it and I talk to a group of people who have done it because i always say you know one or two people you just got to make sure you have the right audience when you're talking about that type of stuff right um but yeah i mean my learnings along the way you know um i uh i kind of fell into this industry as a whole just in general um I didn't know I knew anything about this. It was kind of a weird kind of um, beautiful mind moment in a, in a weird way. Um, I started out uh, and I grew up in the project. So I wasn't a rich kid. I was a poor kid. And, and I had all the experiences of really bad experiences, but also I wouldn't trade my childhood for anything. Cause I feel like I wouldn't be successful in business if I didn't have to deal with all the hard crap I dealt with when I was in the projects. Um, but my, uh, but my real change was, so I, I faked my way through high school. I literally was in a good school, a tech school. I could have did electronics right out of high school, but the money wasn't there. And I was about the money because I was a poor kid. Um, so I worked at an auto dealership and I said that I was fixing car radios to, to just tie it to electronics. So I was on a fake co-op program 
and faked my way through high school, was in the automotive business, and I was really good with numbers. Now, of course, I didn't know what that meant at the time. I did crush math in high school just accidentally and didn't know that that was a thing. Um, I actually finished second in the country in some math thing that my my teacher put me in. Yeah, it was weird. And I had no idea what I was doing. It was just kind of this weird, you know, I did it. I got accolades for it. I got a little award for it because it was, you know, second out of the whole entire nation um, type of thing. And then um, I was in the auto business and I thought I'm going to corner the automotive business because I was in the parts department. And I could tell you, Jeremy, I can still tell you part numbers for Fords right now. I can tell you what a headlight part number is, all of it. All stuck in my head, useless, useless knowledge. <laughs> and um, I thought that that would mean I would corner the market, but I didn't know that the automotive business was going to go down the toilet as far as benefits, money. Like my boss at the time had four weeks paid vacation, a company car, and big money. I slowly watched that all disappear as I was getting older and growing through the business. I started this at age 15 when I was working at the dealerships. And... Um, and um, so when I got a little bit later in life, oh, it's fe feeding back a little bit. My my voice is feeding back a little. <laughs> no one wants to hear me twice, Jeremy. Um, so um, basically what happened, I, I credited all to my wife. I, I was working in the auto business. My wife kept saying to me, this is going nowhere. And one day I came home from work and she said, hey, um, on Monday, we're going to go visit your new school. And I'm like, wait a minute, what? My wife put me into a school without telling me. I had to quit my job. I had to do part-time stuff while I went back to school. And I went back to school for electronics, computers. It was one of these schools that did everything. Of course, electronics, I aced because I did that in high school. While I was in school, I got this opportunity at Fidelity Investments one day a week. And I said, I'm not doing that. And my, I had a friend who worked there or a friend, an older gentleman who worked there. And he said, do it. Any way you can get your foot in the door at Fidelity is going to be a bonus for you. Uh, so I did it one, one day a week. And then I ended up becoming this super intern to Fidelity Investments. Like I worked there, uh, 20 to 30 hours a week while I was going to school. So I went and did nights. I did, you know, three o'clock till 11 every night doing this stuff. And I started realizing this computer stuff was easy. This is the weirdest thing. They would show me something and I would get it. Novell. I banged through it like super quick. When Windows 95 wasn't even released yet, way in the early ages, I had full Windows 95 beta machines set up on a network and Fidelity had forbid it. You'd be fired if they found anything separate from the Novell stuff on the network. So I learned how to use Microsoft and Novell. And I also learned that Microsoft and Novell made it very hard for that to work. There was a lot of driver issues, you know, back in the day. Did really well there, so well that the people that worked the regular shift um, ousted me. They were mad that a subcontractor intern was going to basically get an opportunity to take their job away. So I ended up getting pushed out in a weird twist of fate. I left and ended up at an MSP, which wasn't really, back then it wasn't an MSP, it was an IT provider. And within three months, I learned everything that they had, their whole entire systems. In six months, I became service manager and I switched their office from Novell to Microsoft without them even knowing. I did a little gateway and changed the whole thing over to Microsoft, thought I was going to get fired. Um, Microsoft tried to hire me away from them. They got really nervous and offered me a partnership. So in nine months or almost a year, I became a, a, major, a minority partner in the company. And then over the next three years became an uh, equal partner in, in what, we, what we turned into an MSP. Um, so learnings from that is, if you get an opportunity someplace that could be a bigger opportunity, but you only think it's, you know, it's one day a week or whatever, take it, take the opportunity. It didn't cost me much to do it. Um, and that opportunity led to a bigger piece, not staying at Fidelity, which was completely mismanaged by the way, their tech in the background is, is I can tell you some crazy stories. Um, and then, you know, it led me down this path where I got into managed services and IT and all that stuff. So this first MSP that I got into that wasn't an MSP at the time, we were one of the first people to use ConnectWise. We were in that first 100. Um, Arnie Bellini actually sold us ConnectWise. And I think he was our installer. I'm pretty sure. Um, that's how I'm, in, wow. I'm, old, I'm dating myself now. Right. Um, and then we took off from there. We started to use, and I will say ConnectWise was a big piece of why we blew up because we were doing PSA type stuff before it was a thing, before it was really taking off. Um, we had a homegrown RMM tool that we were working with some guy that was amazing and had some RMM tool before we had finally went into lab tech and all the other RMM tools. 
Um, we were doing precious metals before that was a thing. I stole it from another industry, you know, silver, bronze, bronze, silver, gold, and thought it would be cool for what we were doing and found that everybody was doing it. So I wasn't so that was so great. <laughs> and we, you know, we learned over time, you know, from that learning, we, we learned that almost everybody picked the middle plan, right? You talk, they don't want the low one, but they don't want the expensive one. They all went with the middle plan for the most part. And then over time, I started to realize we should not be allowing our customers to tell us what they want. We should be telling them and become more prescriptive. And so we obviously went to the, it's, it's everything. You're getting the whole package. We're not, we're not negotiating. If you don't do it this way, you're going to take your liability and go someplace else type of mentality. Um, and again, we learned all these things by first making the mistake of thinking they would work and others by talking to other MSPs who are telling us along the way, you know, what to do. Um, <clears throat> but like I would say, as you're growing, if you're in that first million, Find people that you trust to do the jobs that you shouldn't be doing earlier. Stop waiting on hiring an accountant, a lawyer. Those are very important in your business. And then also with delegating tech work and all that stuff. Start figuring out how to do that earlier. Talk to people, talk to peer groups, talk to, talk to people who've done it. Those are areas where you get caught up and hung up and you have problems if you don't have the right folks in mind. And by the way, I know it's scary to trust someone with your money because I personally have a friend who got robbed by an accountant who was taking money out of the books wow. and because they knew nothing about the books. They didn't know it was happening, right? So I, I do highly recommend learning enough about your EBITDA, your bottom line, how to read a P&L, all that stuff early. And, and, then, and then also don't be the person that does it. Once you learn about how it works and you can have reviews, find someone that you trust, find someone that's working with other MSPs or people that have done this before. Um, it's very important. I, I always throw that out there, Jeremy, because it's a, it's a scary, I know it's scary when you're first starting out. It's scary when you're, when you're bigger and you have people wor you know, worried about that happening, but learn enough about all the pieces of the business, learn about sales, learn about marketing, learn about accounting, learn just pieces of it. And then have the experts take those pieces away from you so you can concentrate on building your business, right? That's important. And you may be the best salesperson in the company, but I still think there's a point where you have to pull yourself away from that and have other people do it and build a system. Build a system based on what you were doing. Don't keep it all in your head. A system and a process from what you were doing and how you did it and how you made decisions. Put it all in writing, create it, and let them work with that. Um and then as you get bigger, it gets harder and harder to, you know, determine when, when to hire, how to, how you do that. And that's built on metrics and processes. How many billable hours, how are you paying, you know, <clears throat> how many techs um, do you need to cover a certain number of customers? And there's industry standards and best practices that you can look at and follow, but also still trust your gut a little bit. I think you'll learn over time that, you know, when you need somebody. And I had this weird philosophy, not everybody buys into it. Um, and I still had metrics, but I had this uh, hire a tech and they will come mentality, kind of like the field of dreams, right? Build it and they will come. I always got to this point where I was like, you know what? We need to hire a tech. And they would go nuts on me. I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. The metrics are a little bit off. I, I just knew I had a body. Stuff started to shift to that person and jobs came on and we never fell behind. And sure, every now and again, I was a little off and it took a couple months to catch up to you know, having that person, but what we didn't have to do was train somebody when things blew up, right? We always had people there ready to take that on and grow and, and expand that. So, um, you know, those are some of the things from those, from those early years that I pulled out. And then in the end, if you're, if you're thinking about getting acquired, don't do it on your own. Um, go to people who do this stuff for a living, get your company um, appraised, you know, get that, you know, get your valuation done properly by the right company. Um, and of course, if you're with Taylor business group, that all is part of the program. As you get to a certain size, uh, we have a whole acquisition that piece where we can show you how that looks and why, and what looks good to investors and what doesn't type of thing. Oh, oh that's all right. Sorry. He's throwing I things so many, I have so many follow-up questions. Um, you mentioned building a system. I was wondering if you could give us an example um, let's take a, a technical uh, MSP owner who uh, knows all the technical side, knows how to work with customers, maybe is the best person to, uh, you know, uh, help customers, but it's time to, uh, you know, hire somebody they trust and, 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 and pass it on to them. What system, how, how do you design a system uh, 
where uh, the, the person you hire can be successful in what they do so that you can go and spend your time growing the, <clears throat> growing the business? Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's more about resources, Jeremy, for if you don't know how to do it, you can just go out to, um, you know, and, and find companies that help with that. There are, um, oh God, there's companies like Richardson and Richardson. I don't know if you know Ian Richardson and Carrie, um, they help with that. They do process, they help build process and things like that. And there's a lot of companies like that. I don't want to go, I didn't mean to plug just one, but I know Ian and Carrie right off the top of my head because Ian ran a successful MSP that he sold. Um, and now he's out helping MSPs do this type of stuff. Um, so from a standpoint of that, it's just, again, find, find some, res if you don't know how to do it at all, look out for resources like that. Do a search for, you know, um, building, building processes for my MSP. Um, and be careful. There's a lot of uh, bad actors, I'll say, from a standpoint of businesses that will claim they can do. First of all, the first company that tells you that they're going to triple your business or quadruple your business or, or any slogan like that, stay away from. It. It's not true. Nobody can guarantee that. Nobody. Nobody can guarantee that. And it's and then I don't think anybody can deliver on it, to be honest with you. It's tough. Uh, unless you're making fifty thousand dollars a year and they've turned you into a two hundred thousand dollar company, woof! All right, now that's that, but that's easier growth than when you're at a million. Um, I would, uh, I would, so I would say, yes, yeah, start there and then vet them. If you find some companies that look good and you think they're great, don't just jump in. Talk to, well, talk to them and ask them for for referrals, but they're going to give you their good ones, right? But also go out and go to your pages, go to your Facebook uh, groups, the trusted ones, and Ask your peers, hey, has anybody used this service? Mm. Does it make sense? Um, and also you can run it by me. Like I said, I'm here as a, I'm here as a, um, as a, you know, uh, someone who will help. I, I lost my, my train of thought, Jeremy. You know, Mentor yeah. advisor. Yeah, no, yeah. I, I, no, I no when you're this. old, you know, um, <laughs> no, I'm here as, I'm here as a, I'm here as a resource, really, yeah. truly. Mm -hmm. I want to be a resource to all MSPs that are truly looking to get better. So yeah, if you, if you're looking at, and I, I say this about anything, if you're looking at a vendor, you're looking at a company to help you with your process. If you're looking, reach out, send me a note. Hey, Ken, you heard of these guys? Does this seem legit? And by the way, if I haven't, I know enough people who probably have, and I might be able to refer you to them too. So just do your due diligence like anything else, because what happens too often is we jump on board. We just say, oh crap, I, I, I need this tool. This looks really great because they did a great job presenting. But then when you put it in place, it doesn't work. It doesn't, it doesn't do the things they said it would do. The demo look great, but none of the stuff you're doing in real life work or the back end. They don't have the, the proper back end. And obviously the big thing nowadays is how secure is it? If you're doing stuff that's, you know, SaaS related or network related, you have to, first thing you have to ask is the questions around, does it check off all the CIS controls, right? And, and things with security. So Yeah. It's a lot. It's it's very difficult to run a business, especially an MSP business. Now, the biggest thing is do do your due diligence. Try to find things that you know are going to plug into your systems. And oh, by the way, trust your engineers. When you're testing stuff, don't be the only one testing it. Bring your engineers and say, hey, we're going to have to use this on a daily basis. What do you think? What mm -hmm. are your thoughts? And let them break it um, and see how well it works. Those are those are pretty key. I have one last follow-up question, which is you mentioned uh, earlier in your career, uh, you had an opportunity, Microsoft was trying to hire, recruit you, and uh, the the MSP business that you were part of gave you the opportunity to be a, to be a partner. What led you to choose the path of, you know, entrepreneurship, continuing on with sort of your own business than uh, working at a bigger company? Yeah, Jeremy, I'm stupid. <laughs> no, I Was mean, look, like who, who knows? You don't never, you never know what the path is going to be. For me at the time, I'm a very um, loyal person and sometimes loyal to a fault, right? Um, my, my, my thought process was, man, I've invested so much time and energy with this company. I've got them to a really good spot. We're starting to focus the right direction because they were... The two owners were older than me. I was the youth at the time coming in 
and basically saying, you're doing this wrong, guys. And their approach was the IBM approach, Jeremy. Oh, I pay you, so you should just do your work. And I was like, no, you need uh -huh. to reward people. You need to change. So I was a big rewards guy. I taught them how to reward our employees. We did all kinds of crazy, crazy. If you ever want to ask about rewards, I'll tell you some crazy things we did with rewards for, for, for our people. And our people loved us. They didn't leave for more money. They didn't leave for, and then they did, they came back. So it was yeah. always built that particular way. So for me, I had this loyalty that these guys gave me a shot when I walked into their shop saying, yeah, I, I just came from Fidelity, but I have no background. I'm new to this, but I'll learn your business fast. And they, and they took me on. Um, so I wanted to give back to them. And, and I also knew that Microsoft mm. could be tough. And I didn't know if I wanted to work in the corporate world. I was at the time, I think my wife had just gotten pregnant right now. All four of my kids are grown up. Um, and you know, um, it was nice. Microsoft offered to fly me out to either California or Seattle at the time. I can't remember what it was for. And they're like, we'll fly you and your wife out. Why would you not come out and hear us out? And I'm like, I don't have time. And that pissed Microsoft off. They came at me even harder a few other times um, after that. It was pretty interesting. And actually, the owners at the time got the guy at Microsoft fired, the one of the guys, because he was so aggressive. And we were becoming a Microsoft partner. So he, his, his claim to Microsoft was, why is this guy stealing from us as we're building your program up out here so he actually he actually i gotta give him credit he went after after microsoft and said here we are spending all this money to become microsoft certified and we have a guy who's doing it you guys are trying to steal the one guy away that's building that and they went at the guy and said he was too aggressive and pulled him off wow. so it was interesting but yeah i mean do i think about uh do i think about the microsoft opportunity at times sure you know, you always do, especially when you're, when I'm, I'm an MSP and I'm struggling and I'm banging my head off the wall because I got 5,000 things to do and, you know, not enough time to do it. And those are the times where I was like, man, should I have just gone to Microsoft? But you can't second guess yourself. You make your decisions, you live with them and you move on and you try to improve. Um, so it, for me, it was about loyalty more than anything, Jeremy, you know, and, you know, I will say, if you want to talk about learning, be loyal, but don't let it affect your family. If you are working at a job and you're being loyal and you're putting up with some stuff, that's fine. But if that stuff is directly going to affect your family and your life moving forward, that loyalty can stop. So I have, I've been, I've had, I've been burned a couple of times by sticking it out and then getting kind of, you know, punched and kicked in the rear end on the way through it. And that would be a piece of advice that I would say is just remember you and your family come first and your health comes first. Make sure that, you're doing it for the right reasons and you don't stick it out to the point where it can cause, you know, it, it, it causes problems from the family side of business, your health, whatever it is. So, you know, there is true thing as being loyal to a fault. And thank you so much for, for, for sharing your wisdom. That's the end of the podcast. Yeah. Um, the last, last question here is um, who should reach out to you and what's the best way to reach you, Ken? Um, well, if you can't find me on LinkedIn, you're definitely not trying. Um, I'm all over LinkedIn. You can find me on LinkedIn and connect with me. I will surely accept your connection as long as I see that you have a photo and you've been, you know, you have some connections. <laughs> There's so much crazy stuff on LinkedIn. Uh, you can email me at ken at taylorbusinessgroup.com. And if you want to learn more about Taylor Business Group, you can go to taylorbusinessgroup.com. The website has a whole bunch of information on the coaching and all the things that are going on, but that's the best way to do it. Awesome. And the last plug for us. Uh, hey, folks uh, in the community, are you an MSP and want to win new clients and capture new prospects on your homepage with a risk assessment widget? You reach out to us today at telebi.com and special promotion for podcast listeners. If you know an MSP owner, sales, marketing, or marketing person uh, who could benefit uh, from this, you can connect us over contact at telebi.com. Uh, win $500 referral bonus. Um, so Ken, again, thank you so much. Um, it was uh, so educational and interesting and fun listening to your stories uh, that, that you shared with us today. It's been a pleasure and everybody we will see y'all next time. Thank you all. Thanks very much, Jeremy. And I'll end the recording there.